Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kate Pickett. I'm Professor of Epidemiology at the University of York, and I'm really happy to welcome you to this Festival of Ideas event. So this evening's event is part of York Festival of Ideas Online. And although we're in a different format, the festival continues to aim to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest caliber of public events. The 2020 festival has got over 60 online events offering an inspiring program for all ages. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the adventure we're about to take you on and explore other offerings from the festival. A Couple of technical notes. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. That's at the bottom of your screen if you hover your mouse over it. This is going to be available throughout the talk, so questions can be asked at any time. If you've got technical issues and lose your Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Um, and please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again. I'm delighted tonight to introduce to you Philip Alston. Um, we're going to be having a conversation this evening for about 40 minutes and then we will take some questions for, from you and um, hopefully provide some interesting answers. Philip is um, a former United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, a role he held from 2014 to 2020. He's also a professor at New York University Law School. And what we're going to be talking about tonight are the responses to the COVID-19 crisis um, and the impact that both the crisis, the pandemic itself, and the response to it will have on those who are already experiencing poverty and inequality. So, Philip, it's really nice to have you here this evening. I, we look forward to welcoming you, you to campus at some point in physical presence in the future. But for now, it's really, it's really good to have you here online. Thanks, Kate. So I wanted to ask... Um, the first question, as the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, you visited the United Kingdom in 2018 and wrote a report on your findings. Could you explain to the audience what led you to come to the UK to examine those questions in that role? It seems a long time ago now, of course, uh, but everything seems a long time ago uh, in this uh, dramatic era. Um, initially, um, I wanted to visit the United Kingdom uh, for two reasons. I think one, because the uh, rates of poverty were actually very high comparatively. But equally importantly for me was the fact that the UK was the perfect laboratory for uh, the austerity-driven approach. Um, in no other country has it been quite as overt and dramatic in terms of a government saying at a certain point in 2010, okay, the welfare state as we know it is going to be transformed. Uh, we are going to embark on huge cuts. There's going to be great pain. Uh, but we need to do it for economic reasons. And then followed eight years where the results became increasingly clear uh, and tragic, I would say. And so apart from my interest in the United Kingdom itself, this was pretty important in terms of a lot of the policies that were being pursued in other countries which were taking the same sort of line uh, that we need to cut back. We can't afford these luxuries. This is a new era uh, and so on. You talked to um, some young people in London who are young equality campaigners for the Equality Trust, of uh, which I'm a co-founder and um, currently chair of the board of trustees. And you, you very kindly wrote us a nice email afterwards saying how much you, you'd valued talking to those young people and, and how important an experience that had been. Did you feel you, you really got a good sense of the impact of austerity from your trip around the UK and, and from, from the people you met? 
It's very interesting to reflect on these things because I'm not a, a politician. Um, uh, I'm not even an activist uh, in the sense of being out on the streets working with people uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm, for better and worse, an academic, uh, but one who tries to make a difference through uh, the UN system and the opportunities that it plays to or, or, or it has to hold government's feet to the fire. Uh, so I don't, uh, in my daily work, actually get out a lot uh, and engage with people. And I think as an academic, there's a, a side of me that would be quite skeptical to say, hang on, the Equality Trust is going to get together 15 kids and, you know, they're going to come up with this perfect combination of black and brown and white and yellow and whatever else. And they're going to have, you know, equal numbers of boys and girls and they're going to talk about whatever. Um, but in fact, you know, I mean, I still have a vivid memory of our conversation, as I do of many of the others that I had. It really brings the reality out in a way that doesn't happen from endless reading of reports and looking at government statistics and so on. Um, you know, the kid that describes how difficult it is being out on the street uh, because there are drugs out there. There are all sorts of things that actually are very appealing. Uh, so I try to stay off the streets, but at, I can't stay home because there's loads of people, and anyway, I don't like my family particularly, and I certainly don't like being on top of them. Uh, the youth centre used to be my um, saving grace. Uh, austerity's got to it. Uh, they've cut it back radically. It's barely worth going there. A lot of us are out on the street again. Um, and I could recount many of the other stories, but they just really bring home... Uh, the dramatic impact that these decisions take and the wholly unnecessary um, pain and sacrifice that they inflict. Well, your decision to talk to our young equality campaigners actually made a real difference to them. You know, they described how important it was to them to feel that they were being heard and being listened to. So, so thank you for that. But actually, what you just said... <coughs> raises real questions about the impact of the response to the coronavirus crisis and the expectation that people are locked down, sheltering in place in their homes. Um, it's really positive for some people and it's really negative for others. Um, and I, I feel that this crisis is, it, it's, giving us a sharper focus, it's bringing into focus all kinds of inequalities and problems that were existing before and, and highlighting them. What, what are the things that you're thinking about most as you look at how different nations, different states or regions have responded to the coronavirus crisis? What, what are you most anxious about? <laughs> um... I think I'm anxious about everything, but uh, maybe I'm an anxious uh, character. Um, I mean, this, uh, the, the starting point uh, which we heard uh, at the beginning of the pandemic was we're all in this together, yeah. uh, which meant that um, some worker on the, um, on the tube was as vulnerable as the Prime Minister. Uh, and indeed, the Prime Minister got COVID-19 and came uh, close to uh, being uh, very sick. Um, but of course, it's nonsense. We're not all in it together. Uh, the wealthy, uh, even the middle classes, have endless escape routes. Uh, when they get sick, their chances of getting better are infinitely higher their ability to uh, distance, their ability to stock food and so on is endless. Um, so when we go back to the advice, which we all thought was so sage and pithy, 
uh, to uh, wash hands, to keep distance, uh, to not go out, uh, etc. That is simply none of that's an option for poor people. Uh, they live in cramped and crowded conditions. They've never been six feet apart from uh, others. They have no food supplies. Uh, they may not have a house in which they can shelter. Uh, they may be homeless or they may be moving around. And they, in any event, have absolutely no money. So somehow they have to get money uh, or get food. Uh, and when we saw what happened, I mean, you can go all around the world, but the Indian uh, approach was perhaps the most dramatic, an overnight lockdown, total lockdown. And what we saw were the most um, obvious manifestations of all the migrant workers who were suddenly forced to traipse home hundreds of miles, maybe more, uh, with no public transport to take them, no resources, no one caring along the way. But even the average person who didn't have much money was expected to stay at home. And if they went out, often they were beaten up by the police and forced back in. Uh, God knows how they survived. Um, I mean, I could talk at many other levels as well. I think from a human rights perspective, uh, we've we've had a terrible pandemic. Um, governments uh, around the world have used the pandemic as a justification, as a shield or a um, a, a hiding uh, place uh, for introducing measures that had very little to do with COVID nineteen. Some of them are very long term agenda, just to cut back on rights, to restrict public space even further. Um, legislation being pushed through that's got nothing to do with COVID-19 but is uh, oppressive in a great many ways. Um, complete uh, power given to the police. Um, I, I'm just, I mean, I can keep talking. I'm not sure what issues I should focus on, but... Um, I, I do a lot of work um, locally on, on mm. public health in Bradford, which is a city in the north of England with mm. high levels of deprivation and um, a large black and minority ethnic population. And we've been surveying people's experiences of, of lockdown. Um, and these are populations that, that we know about their circumstances before. So we're able to actually look at, at change. And of course, what we're finding is high levels of depression, clinical levels of depression and anxiety, um, high levels of worries about um, housing, food, employment, finances, um, particularly in our overcrowded, um, privately rented accommodation, um, and, all, and all of these things sort of traveling together. And what's really interesting in the UK is I think we have had quite a positive initial response from government about supporting people's livelihoods. So people who are furloughed are getting 80% of their previous incomes paid by the government at the moment. That sounds quite good, but if you were only just managing before, and a lot of our population in Bradford were just about managing before, because it's a low income population, 80% of just about managing isn't managing. Um, and so we were sort of unveiling this, this hidden epidemic of what low pay and low income livelihoods means for people in the medium and the long term, as well as the short term. Have you seen positive responses that, that you think are sort of best practice? Um. I'm, I'm sorry if I, <clears throat> I tend to focus, of course, on the bad news um, in the sense that um, I'm trying to look at government responses, trying to also see how they play out in the longer term. Um, I mean, I think when we talk about positive responses, it's um, going to focus on responsible government 
on consultation, on giving reasons for decisions, uh, and trying to bring the community along with you. And I think there are certainly some countries where we've seen uh, those positive developments, but a lot of other countries where we've seen none of that happening. I think my bigger concern, though, in response to your comment <clears throat> is, well, is twofold. First, I'm sceptical because a lot of the rather generous benefits that have been given, including the 80% of your furloughed and so on, um, I think are motivated primarily by the fact that the people who are suddenly unemployed and who are suddenly down and out are um, respectable people. Mm. I've put that in inverted commas. In other words, people that didn't themselves ever expect to meet uh, chronic unemployment uh, potential destitution and they were humming along nicely. And so governments, particularly conservative governments, are uh, horrified. These are our people. Uh, these are people who voted for us. They're the sort of people with the values that we share. So we have to give them really good benefits. And suddenly the miserliness and the endless conditionalities and the endless hardships that were part of welfare for the others um, are seen as being cruel and inhuman. And so we open up the coffers where before there was no money. Now there's been a lot of money. And I think that's very troubling. But the, it would be lovely, however, if we could see this as the start of a new approach. In other words, you people in power have actually seen much more closely than you ever did before the misery that the bottom 20% or whatever live on an everyday basis and you're saying that's not acceptable. You've got to then come through for the future. But the big worry, of course, is that uh, there will be a second wave of austerity uh, that once the uh, respectable people are back in employment and it's only the 20% who just are not able to find decent work or who suffer from illness or even the mental health problems that you described, which are going to have affected huge numbers of people from COVID-19, they will again be left uh, in a parlous situation and the new need for austerity will be used to justify that. And the, bigger, the biggest issue then that comes out of this is that this has been a time of immense upheaval. It's been a time when a lot of the received wisdom has been thrown out the window. We need a new approach. But what we're not doing is looking at longer term approaches. Uh, obviously, climate change is part of that. All governments are struggling badly to try to meet the sort of targets that are desperately needed. But instead of saying, okay, we're mobilizing many billions of pounds extra, we're going to link that to climate change and we're going to link that to longer term job employment. We're going to link it to better um, benefits in various ways. We're going to have a serious assault on the need for public housing. Uh, I don't see any of that. Uh, instead, most of the re responses have been overwhelmingly <coughs> short term. The European Union is actually looking as if it's going to prioritise sort of Green New Deal, um, green recovery, mm. and, and, and require that um, the climate emergency is considered in the response to the COVID-19 recovery. Um, this happens just at the moment that, you know, the UK has left the European <laughs> Union, so will not benefit from, from those um, potential responses. And of course, the USA has always sort of just thrown its hands up and said it's not, it's not going to participate in, in addressing the climate emergency under Trump. Um, so we're hearing quite a lot. I'm hearing from various networks I'm involved in internationally about not 
bouncing back to where we were, but bouncing beyond, not building back, but building better. Um, lo lots of sort of key phrases around this, lots of principles about how our response to this should be more inclusive, it should address inequality, it should address climate change. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of noise about this. How realistic do you think it is that people will actually, uh, well, governments will actually take the opportunity to do things differently? I think the EU initiative is obviously a very important one. Um, uh, I've read a lot about it. I've read various critiques claiming that, you know, a lot of the so-called new money that's being mobilized, the 750 million euros, billion euros, um, is not really new money, that it's recycling and so on. Um, I don't think that we should be too skeptical at this point. I think we should take it at face value. And I think it's a very good um act of leadership uh, on behalf of the EU, uh, and I hope they can follow through with it. Um, we don't see it. Uh, one of the things that I'm um, becoming uh, increasingly frustrated by uh, at the international level is in relation to the so-called Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. This is the UN's flagship uh, response, not just to poverty, but to development poverty, development policy generally. And all of the comments that I see are saying, okay, we've got to get through this. Let's really refocus on the SDGs. The problem is that the SDGs, I think, are actually quite flawed. Uh, I don't think the SDGs, uh, as they were formulated, are serious about eliminating poverty. I don't think they're serious about eliminating inequality. And I don't think they take climate change very seriously. Sadly, five years is a long time. And when these were drafted in 2013, 2014, adopted in 2015, climate change urgency was actually far less. And so the SDGs are not particularly strong on that issue. So to the extent that we're all doubling down on the SDGs, it's missing the real set of challenges. And that worries me. Yeah. Uh, and the UN, at least for its part, and most of the so-called development agencies uh, don't have the flexibility, the agility, or I suppose the commitment to be able to say, look, we need to go way beyond uh, what we've got here. Uh, this is not going to bring a, a better future. It's not going to do any of the things that I talked about, eliminate poverty, uh, reduce inequality, or really contribute to lowering global warming. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, for me, you know, the SDGs, they're an important um, recognition that things needed to be different. And it, I thought it was quite remarkable that we did manage to get all countries to, to sort of agree them but they are just a dashboard and the connections between them are not made explicit. So, you know, there's a goal to reduce inequality, but there's also a goal to increase economic growth. And there are goals to um, address climate change. And the three of those don't, don't fit together. If you do one, you're not necessarily going to do the other. So yeah, I take, I take your point. Some things that have happened as a result of the COVID-19 crisis have actually been positive sort of human health and well-being. So air pollution has been reduced <laughs> in many of our um, urban settings worldwide with significant impact on, on population health. You know, it's possible that more deaths will have been saved by reductions in air pollution than will have been caused by COVID-19. Um, we're also seeing, you know, an outbreak, I would call it a pandemic of social solidarity in neighborhoods throughout the world. You know, it's, 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 it's heartening and wonderful to see the ways in which communities are sort of coming together, providing support to one another. We've, we've seen that um, governments can print money when they want to for social goods and, 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 and public um, goods. And we've seen a real recognition of who the key workers are in our society. 
you know, it's not the bankers, it's not the CEOs, it's it's the healthcare workers, it's the care workers, it's the people who stock our supermarket shelves, people who come and take away the rubbish. Um, and I think it's a worldwide movement, isn't it, that we're going outside on Thursday evenings at eight o'clock and clapping for our key workers and recognizing the role that they play. What do you think the possibilities are that we manage to kind of take those positives forward? Um, you're right, of course. Um, obviously, air pollution is a, uh, a giant killer uh, in many societies. Uh, and a lot of the pressure has been taken off because of the slowdown. Um, I'm even surprised at uh, myself living in New York. I suddenly look up in the sky and say, oh, my God, it's an aeroplane. Um, when, in fact, you know, uh, a few months ago, aeroplanes were crisscrossing every um, couple of minutes and one would never look up. Um, I, I, and you're absolutely right about the social solidarity. Um I, I wish I could be a more optimistic character, and I need to be, um, because obviously there is the potential here for a serious social movement that seizes the occasion uh, and changes the way people think and the way they operate. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that business uh, is uh, significantly changing. Um, I see all of the statements that are being made in support uh, of George Floyd and so on by uh, business leaders. Um, but um, the big challenge for me is not to um, try to rein in the rogue police so that they kill a few less people and do it on a non-discriminatory basis. Uh, the big challenge is to change the society. Um, black people are uh, always going to be victimized as long as they are patently poorer, patently less well-educated, uh, patently less able to get decent jobs. And all of that's completely baked into the system. Uh, there is discrimination all the way through. Uh, and so... That's the real place to start, and it's not going to be brought about by businesses, no matter how much solidarity they express. For the most part, governments are not yet convinced. You raised the issue of growth. Um, there is, a, an, an, and the SDGs are premised on, you know, very uh, lavish rates of growth in order to achieve uh, their objectives. But we know that that model isn't workable and that in the places where the most growth has been achieved, um, poverty has barely been touched. And in many cases, it's even exacerbated uh, by the forces that have brought the great uh, increase in GDP. Um, so I guess the challenge is that people really do have to start taking control. They have to see these as political issues. Um, they cannot fall for the justifications that are offered by governments who say, we need more growth because that's what's going to cure poverty. It hasn't cured poverty. Uh, full employment in the UK uh, until a few months ago coexisted with huge figures including over one third of children growing up in poverty. You had all the growth you could have wished for. You had the highest unemployment you could have wished for, and it was failing. Yeah. So people need to really translate their euphoria, if that's what it is, that we can see a different future into a political agenda. And I don't yet see political parties in most of our countries um, adjusting in that way. I was very interested and, and, and tweeted about this at the time when you made your report 
on the impact of austerity in the UK in 2018, that our then Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, responded by saying that she was disappointed in your report because she felt it was political. As if poverty <laughs> and inequality and deprivation are not always political and as if you should not have been thinking and addressing political issues. Um, so what you're saying about you know, the political choices we make as we come out of this crisis, that's really important. But also, if we're thinking about the resilience of populations to future pandemics and future problems, then all of this is, is, is hugely relevant as well. I mean, at the moment, we're, we're thinking about one virus, one pandemic, but actually we've been predicting this kind of scenario for decades in public health. You know, we've, we've been worried about emerging infections. We've had an Ebola crisis in much of Africa. We had Zika in Latin America. Um, we had SARS and MERS previously. We knew that we were sort of waiting. Sooner or later, something was going to be even more global and even, even more problematic. And we in the UK, encountered this crisis with a real lack of resilience. We have a huge um, mm -hmm. population health problem. Our life expectancy gains had stopped because of austerity. Um, infant mortality rates were rising. We've got a massive epidemic of mental health problems. We've got a huge amount of comorbidity, high levels of obesity, which means that any, any emerging infection is going to have serious repercussions for more of us than it would have done if we were a healthier population. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about increasing our resilience as we go forward. I think one of the things that I always wondered about is how it is that the conservative government um, which purports to view everything through an economic lens um, was not able to bring itself to say, look, to be honest, we don't really care about these uh, workers and others living in poverty, but it's going to be really bad for gross national product because these workers are not going to be able to contribute as much. They're a drag on the economy. Uh, they're requiring more interventions and so on. Whereas if we could get them to a minimum level of well-being, uh, if we could educate their children so that they can become productive workers, uh, we can, quote, grow the economy. But that sort of thinking never really caught on. Instead, uh, policies are driven by actually by a desperate desire to make the society more unequal. In other words, to make the richest ever richer and not to worry about the rest. So the optimistic way of seeing this pandemic and those that are to come is that they will actually make us realize that we're all in it together. And even though I don't give a damn about poor people, I have to acknowledge that something's got to be done to improve their situation or I'm going to be more vulnerable, I'm going to be more exposed, and the economy that I do care about is going to suffer enormously. And if it takes that sort of, you know, totally instrumentalist, amoral analysis to arrive at the conclusion that ensuring a basic welfare state, going back to beverage, you know, beverage which was effectively overturned during the period of austerity. If it means going back to beverage and saying the analysis that he came up with still holds, the society will be stronger uh, post-European Union, making our own way in the world, we're going to do it on a different basis and we are going to start addressing uh, the plight of those who are not well off and will all benefit economically and socially and ideally restore 
uh, what it once meant to be British, which is not what the Brexit debate was all about, but to be British, at least in the best sense, was a real sense of community, a real sense of shared values and solidarity. And that needs to take a renewed political form and it needs to be founded on basic notions of social justice. Combined with the selfish analysis that I um, sort of uh, parodied before, uh, that even if I don't care, it's in my interests. We're at about the sort of 40 minute mark here. We're, we're getting lots of really interesting questions in, in from the audience. Are you happy for us now to move to Q&A? So um, I'll start with one that's come in asking, how do you think local communities, I suppose that means smaller neighbourhoods or, or cities rather than sort of nations or states, how do you think they can employ a human rights-based approach to thinking about how we come out of, of this crisis and, and the kind of recovery we might pursue? That is a, a great question. Um, the The problem with human rights, there are many, of course, but for t for far too long, human rights have been seen as uh, the rights of exotic groups, if you like, um, often far away. You know, we're much more concerned if we talk about human rights, we're going to look at the Uyghurs rather than the people next door. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the torture that is applied to lots of people. We're going to talk about violence against women. That's a good thing uh, to talk about that. But we haven't seen human rights as being, first of all, local, what's going on in our community, and secondly, as very directly implicating broader notions of well-being, what we call economic and social and cultural rights. And I think one of the really encouraging things in the UK is the extent to which local groups are now starting to um, see human rights in a much more holistic way as bringing together a broad range of issues and implicating uh, large coalitions. It's no longer just about acts of physical violence or whatever. It's about the way in which a society functions, the way in which it treats its less well-off. Um, and I think that there's a lot happening at the local level. I know in York, I've read some... Um, fact sheets and so on put out by what's called the Human Rights City Network. Yeah. Uh, they are very um, instructive, very enlightened, uh, and I think very helpful. Um, there are examples in other cities in the UK that I'm aware of. There's, of course, an initiative. I, I was always told um, not to talk about Scotland when I was in England, but um, because it wouldn't persuade anyone. But um, the Scots are moving ahead with um, a major uh, renewal of focus on human rights with a new charter and a new uh, body that's being set up, and that embraces comprehensively this notion of social rights. Uh, so I absolutely agree that there's huge scope uh, to... Uh, revitalize human rights through local activism. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but that question came from Stephen Pittam, who is a friend and colleague um, who previously worked with the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Thank you, Stephen, for that question. It's nice to have you with us this evening. Um, we have a question about what, what the new... And, and, and God bless the Rowntree uh, Trust. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we have a question about what... What should a new social contract be between government and people? I mean, <laughs> I, guess, I guess we've seen government suddenly be able to act in, in ways that they previously pretended they couldn't. So we had, for instance, in the UK, we had um, a policy, a sort of strategy 
to reduce um, homelessness and we were going to get rid of the homeless population in, in a few years time. And then all of a sudden we were going to do it by next week. And we did it. So having seen how government can move, how's that going to change the social contract? I think, I mean, one of the main points that, and this is probably what upset Amber Rudd, um, the main points I made in my report was that austerity is not an economic policy, but an ideology. So I don't think the facts show that austerity was driven by uh, economic necessity. Um, various other countries similarly placed, adopted very different approaches and didn't uh, embrace the, all of the negative consequences that happened in the UK. Uh, I think austerity was pursued because it was the uh, apex of the Thatcherite philosophy uh, that people should be on their own, that governments should be small, that um, you make your own bed and you lie in it, that there isn't a social contract. The social contract is that you can get as rich as you possibly can and we won't stand in your way, which of course is not a social contract, that's uh, abandonment. Um, and so I think what's needed is this new ideology where people, there's some trust in people. You don't set up unemployment programs. Uh, you don't set up universal credit in such a way that there's a complete distrust, that there's a totally gratuitous uh, punitive measures. The nonsense that people can't believe uh, in other countries that you're supposed to show that you're searching for employment for 35 hours a week uh, even if you've been unemployed for months. Uh, you know, this is purely a way of punishing the poor and making it miserable rather than saying, okay, we're going to look at a whole range of constructive measures which will treat you as a real human person, assume that you're not a scammer uh, and that you really do want to improve your life. Uh, and I think that's the sort of social contract that one needs to move towards. And governments are well capable of it if they want to. And the economy can certainly bear the costs of that because the economic benefits are immense, but they were never factored in to the equation. We have a great question from an anonymous um, attendee who says, I'm 16. What can I do? to achieve the change we need. We got any thoughts for our, our young audience? Uh, it is a great question. Um, I think there's no, uh, there's no recipe, uh, of course, because what all of us can do depends on who we are, how we're situated and so on. And none of us should feel bad uh, because we can't do what Kate does in terms of all of her work on a whole range of issues, can't do what I do in terms of uh, the focus on poverty. Uh, you've got to do what you can do uh, locally. Um, I mean, for the younger generation, uh, we seem to already be losing sight again a little bit of climate change. But climate change is going to be a, a catastrophe for the younger generation. Uh, I do almost cry uh, when I think about, I've got two teenage sons and the world that they're heading into is horrendous when you look at the realities of climate change. What are we doing around the world? We're refinancing fossil fuel industries on a vast scale. Trump is doing away with all sorts of regulations that restrict uh, their activities. Congress is looking at ever more money to support them financially. Uh, the same thing is happening in a great many other countries. All of this is another little nail or big nail in the coffin of future generations. 
So I think that climate change may be as good an entry point as any. But again, if climate change is going to be effective, that then leads to what we call, what Kate referred to earlier as a Green New Deal type approach, where it's got to be accompanied by broader policies of social justice, redistribution and so on. Okay, let's talk about racism a bit. There's a number of questions that have come in um, about whether or not the experience of the the pandemic has highlighted issues of racism enough that actually something might change. In the UK, I remember back in March when when we first um, started to get cases um, and we were first experiencing lockdown, the first 10 deaths in the National Health Service of of NHS workers who died of COVID-19 were all from black and minority ethnic populations. And and we've seen over time that yes, we're seeing both more infections and worse outcomes in people from black and minority ethnic populations. I don't think, um, and this is based on my hunch as an epidemiologist, that this is to do with any kind of genetic susceptibility, or there might be tiny, tiny bits of that in there. It's because we've got more people in black and minority ethnic populations who are key workers and therefore exposed, um, or are living in multi-occupancy, overcrowded housing, or because of health inequalities, I think health inequalities have more pre-existing conditions that make them more vulnerable. It's a whole host of things. This combined um, with the death of, of George Floyd, what, what's it going to do? Is this a real moment where things might really materially change? I think we're waiting to see in the United States at least, where uh, again, it's the epicenter uh, of all of this. I think racism has been really laid bare um, by this combination of COVID-19 striking much more uh, terribly, uh, much harder uh, in minority populations for a whole range of reasons. The sort of housing conditions they have, the sort of health conditions they're subjected to, uh, all of these things combine to make them the perfect prime targets um, and I think uh, police violence is is, is the same. Um, I just don't know. The, um, I, th- you might, I mean, we're getting, if we're talking about the US, obviously we're going to get into my own personal political um sense. Uh, I'm not an American citizen, so I don't vote in the United States. Um, I find it very frustrating that the um, seriously progressive change candidates uh, like Sanders and Warren were um, dumped unceremoniously Uh, when it looked as though they might have significant support and the uh, essentially the um, the elite coalesced instantly around a candidate who they assume to be electable uh, but who uh, doesn't have a uh, truly progressive bone in his body And so at a time when people are talking about defunding the police, which of course is a very radical proposal, but it's also a code for rethinking the way in which we relate as a community, the way in which municipal budgets are spent and the values that are being provoked, promoted. Um, Biden immediately says, no, 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 I won't have any of that. Uh, but we will have greater accountability on the part of the police. Uh, I spent six years as UN Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial killings, police accountability, military accountability. Uh, And uh, the thing that I learned very clearly in that is that it's the broader societal values. The police are there to reflect the values that the society has, 
and you can't just take them apart and say, right, we're going to train you guys. Uh, if the rest of us are racist, if the policies that governments are pursuing, even in terms of housing, in terms of childcare, in those areas, if they're racist, then, of course, you're going to have a racist police force. So it's essential to go from the George Floyd movement uh, to this deeper analysis and, again, political mobilisation. So... In the UK, we had a situation prior to this crisis where we were being told that the British public had had enough of experts. <clears throat> um, now we have a government that tells us they are following the science. Now, of course, the science is a sort of <laughs> mythological beast like a unicorn. There is no such thing as the science. How much do you think actually what we're seeing is evidence-based in different places? And are we, are, are we actually sort of seeing a resurgence of respect for science and expertise and, and knowledge because of this crisis? And, and is that helpful? Uh, hopefully. Uh, I mean, I think the whole... Uh, fake news um, movement. Um, thanks very much to my beloved compatriot, Rupert Murdoch, um, who's the godfather of all fake news and much that's uh, happened in that area. But uh, I think that whole movement has really destabilized um, all of us. Uh, in terms of not knowing where to turn, in terms of having difficulty sorting out uh, the nonsense from the the real. Um, I think the uh, COVID-19 experience has put expertise back on uh, onto the back in the front row, if you like. Uh, but we're still grappling very much with how we balance uh, political judgment and expert opinion. Uh, I don't think any of us would want a chief medical officer who has no political alignment at all to be laying down the law. Um, but we also don't want some idiot politician saying, well, either I don't want to listen to these people, as Bolsonaro is doing, or I've heard them and I'm going to do the opposite. I think what we're striving for is the balance where uh, I want you to listen to the expert uh, and I want them to have full airtime. Then I'm going to respond, but I'm not going to simply say, I don't like the look of Kate Pickett and I'm not going to follow what she says, or I think she sounds great and I'll go with it. I want a sort of balanced assessment. I was not persuaded by what Professor Pickett said about X, but I do think what she said about Y is wise and I would call on people to follow it. So I think that is what we're really trying to grasp our way back to is a balanced approach, but which does have expertise very much in the picture uh, and brings back um, so-called evidence-based decision-making. Um, what I said about why was definitely very wise. <laughs> um, I have been working um, with, with a group of colleagues who've been looking at potentially the role that um, gender plays in, in policy making and, and it's been noted that countries with female leaders have actually been doing better in responding to the coronavirus crisis than um, countries with um, male leaders. I suspect that that's to do with all the reasons why countries elect female leaders. Would you like to comment on the, on the gender issue? Um. Well, you've got one I, minute. To be oh, warm. okay. I mean, I think uh, I mean gender is at the heart of so many of our problems. Um, the way in which women are treated, even in societies that uh, fancy themselves as being really egalitarian and so on, is is abysmal. We've still got a huge way to go. 
Uh, it's amazing when you look around the world. It's hard to, maybe this is a very sexist comment, but it's hard to imagine any woman behaving in the way that, say, uh, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Bolsonaro, Mr. Modi, uh, Mr. Trump, uh, and these other sort of major macho politicians have responded uh, in all of this. Uh, and instead, you see the the Merkels and the Aherns and uh, the others much more thoughtful, much more reflective uh, and playing real leadership rather than macho man. Thank you. Thought-provoking answer. Thanks. Thank you very much, Philip Olsen. It's, it's been great that you've joined us tonight. We're a couple of minutes away from the top of the hour when we, when we have to break. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for joining us and, and coming to the York Festival of Ideas online. And I do hope we'll welcome you in person sometime in the future. Um, just to our audience, the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the watch again section of the festival website, but allow a couple of days for it to appear. Um, we very much hope you'll continue to be engaged with York Festival of Ideas. Check out the website for full details of all the events coming up. And I just wanted to highlight one in particular. Lord Richard Layard will be talking about happiness on Thursday at 1 p.m., um, giving the annual Richard Wilkinson Lecture for the Equality Trust, which this year is being hosted by the York Festival of Ideas, and I'll be chairing that. So. We would love to see you there and hope that you will join us. If you want to tell us about um, your thoughts on these events and continue the conversation, please tweet using the hashtag York Ideas. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again, Philip. Um, and I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Kate.